So anyway, I talked a lot about the power of views and how many things have been moved into core in Drupal 8 and things like the WYSIWYG and, the, and views and, and a few other things. So moving on, um, I'd like to take a look at just real quickly at the, the top. Um, we'll just look at the first page that, that has the top 100. But as you can see from the pagination, there's, there's literally thousands of modules, right? And, and not everything that we're looking here is, at here is necessarily just a module. I mean, this even includes core itself. So, and this obvious, and this also includes a lot of Drupal seven specific modules that wouldn't be applicable to eight anymore. They're either in core or they're they're not being ported over to, to Drupal eight. So this is everything, right? But I had talked about views, and look where it sits at four, right? Now we're gonna. I'm going to be mentioning token later, but token is a module that you don't really use it specifically. Like you don't say, you know, I need to, my website to do this function. I'm going to install, install token. But there's a lot of things you're going to want to do with your website that's going to, you're going to want to install a module that's going to help you get there. And it's going to require token, which is why token is also way up there. Same with chaos tool suite. Those, that, that's another module that most of the, most widely used Drupal modules require these these top modules. So, if you're new to Drupal and you're new and you're new to like um, installing modules to to get your your site building going, just be aware that many of many modules have requirements and and you need to pay attention to that um, when you're installing because it, it it's going to tell you right off the bat. It's going to error out and say, oh, this, this module requires whatever. So, I mean, it'll let you install the module, but you won't be able to turn it on until you install the other modules. All right. So that's kind of the, the top 100. And, and it'll, I think, let me see if I even put it in my slide. I did. So I, as I was saying, some modules are not used directly, you know. And it's important to pay attention to those de dependencies. Um, but I also want to point out that if you need a certain function and there's a module that's built for it and it's not in the top 100, I wouldn't let that concern you necessarily. Um, that, ooh, you know, this might be, you know, is it a good module or whatever? Oh, uh, you know, there's a lot of really great modules out there that are well maintained. That, that will provide the functionality that you need. So there's really no point in, in spending development money or time, if you're a developer, on building a module that is already out there, right? So don't be too concerned if it's on page seven. You know, it's what you really need to pay attention because there are some red flags. You do need to, if you're going to use a module on your site, you know, A, it, you do want to make sure that it, it has passed the, the security um, I don't call it a certificate, but we can look at, let's go ahead and, and look at a, uh, a module so it'll make sense. Let's look at token. So stable releases for this project are covered by the security advisory policy. If a module that you want to use doesn't have that and you're, Gonna, you know, the, and your site's of sub, some substantial size, uh, you might want to rethink whether that is something you want to use because that those security policies, you know, the problem with it is sometimes they, you know, the developers might use outdated code, which it might be vulnerable. So you will want to pay attention to that. Th that that it would be one of the key things to look for in picking your modules to get something done, a specific task. Okay. So with that said, um, I picked these. Now, I picked these because they're my favorites. They're not necessarily going to cover everything that you need to do by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I would imagine that there, a vast majority of these would, would go into a, a build of, of any site of any substantial size. Question. Would it be possible to get this information? This, this slide deck actually is publicly accessible, right? So if you're paying attention to that, that 
URL up there, that's slides.com, Rick P modules, and I'm in live mode. But if you just go to Rick P modules, or Rick P, you'll see all my slides, and, and including slide decks from previous years, right? And um, to that note, I, I started on a, on a site, because we're gonna touch, at, towards the very end, I'm gonna touch on media, because you know, again, media is one of those things that it's hard to imagine a site that doesn't have media, right? Um, I started building a, 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 um, like a page of a tutorial about how to end to end get media working in, um, in Drupal 8. Because media itself, the, the, and we'll cover this later, I don't want to spend too much time on it now, but it's actually in core. But we'll, we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm only going to actually demonstrate probably the first two and then we'll just talk about the rest so that we can spend a little bit more time on things that are in core that are worth looking at, okay? Uh, but by all means, if anybody sees a module that I don't plan on installing in front of you and, and you're really curious about it and want to see it installed, I, I'm happy to do that. Like I said, there's, there's really no schedule here. We don't have to stick to anything, all right? So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to go ahead and... and um, I'm going to copy this address because this is, this is just the FTP download. And I'm mentioning that because, um, okay, hold on a minute. Let me find out, oops, why we can't access this site. Mm, looks as though something re restarted. So give me just a minute. So I wasn't planning on this demonstration, but what I'm doing, I'm running Lando. Anybody heard of Lando? Great. Lando is a, um, a tool for running a website locally so that you can actually build a website without even having hosting yet, right? So you could, you could develop your whole environment, your whole website locally, which is a workflow that's highly recommended, by the way, for Drupal or any, any other site, really, you know, be able to develop locally and then deploy to production. And so I, I use Lando to do that. Um, there are lots of other tools. If you're on Windows, there's a, a Windows Apache something. It's called um, WAMP is the acronym for short. Uh, there's LAMP, which is Linux, Apache, PHP. So that's for Macs, et cetera. Uh, Lando's like a all-in-one package. <laughs> it just has everything in it. You know, you just fire up Lando and read the documentation, and it's pretty easy to get a site started. You don't have to worry about spending a whole lot of time installing a bunch of software and getting it to work together, which is what you would probably have to do with a LAMP setup. So anyway, I fired it up because I don't know if something happened between there and here. It, it, it died, but it fired back up. Yay, because that we wouldn't want to spend too much time diagnosing that. So this is a fresh install of Drupal, no modules installed yet, right? And in my humble opinion, I, I, like, I wouldn't even think about getting started building a website without the admin toolbar. This is like my number one must have because it drives me crazy that if I go in here and I wanna just look or check something in my configuration, that I don't have a drop down menu to get to some of these sub items because I'm not good at looking at laundry lists. My eyes just go blurry, and it takes me forever to find even the most simplest thing on a page like this. So the very, very first thing I'm going to do is install admin toolbar so that everything else I show you, I'll be able to use that toolbar. <laughs> so like I said, we're not going to install every module, but I want to install that this one because, A, I want you to see what it's like to install a module. Um, and what's interesting about that in particular is... And they, they call it extend now in Drupal 8 instead of modules. I'm not real sure why. That, to me, seemed like funny nomenclature, but hey, that's just me. Um, so there's like this rule of thumb that says, 
don't modify your configuration on a, in a production site. Okay, fair enough. But I have another presentation on configuration management because if you're building a really small site, like a little mom and pop shop thing or a little no, nonprofit and you don't really necessarily have resources to spend money on really fancy hosting where they're gonna give you multiple environments, a dev environment, a staging environment, a production environment, you just have your live environment and you really can't afford to do much else, uh, then trying not to do any configuration at all in, in your production environment can be a little tricky. But like I said, in that session, I actually took that, that concept of not having the funds for a fancy hosting setup. I mean, have my website on shared hosting, $3 a month, but I want a local environment because I want to test stuff. Then I don't want to break my site. You can actually do that. All right. So, but we're going to pretend that, you know, none of that exists. We're going to install modules in the UI, which is absolutely configuration, but we're going to do that anyway. So I'm going to install a new module right here in the UI. And in a way, this is a kind of neat because it shows you just how powerful Drupal is and how easy it is to get things going, right? You don't actually have to go to the command line necessarily, right? Because as developers, we tend to install everything on the command line, but you don't need to do that really. Oops, <laughs> I didn't get the URL somehow. There we go. So I'll install it. It says, yay, you did it. Now I'll en enable it. Because it only installs it, it doesn't enable it. Because in some cases, there could even be dependencies that have, been not, have not been met yet. So it's got a nice little filter there. And I'm going to install the toolbar. And I'm even going to install the extra tools, because I, I particularly like the extra tools. You could not turn them on and see what you think. But what's great is, once that installs, you'll see that I now have wave over menus to help me get to things like performance without having to scan through that long page, right? And if there's one thing that's definitely your friend in Drupal, it's the performance page because when you make changes to style and stuff like that, you need to clear caches. So um, I didn't do anything yet, so I don't really need to clear caches, but it's good to know that that's there because it, it, if, if something doesn't seem to be occurring that should be, clear the caches. It might fix it. All right. So that's toolbar. Um, like I said, I, I, could, I could never live without it. Okay. So now... Let's build a piece of content, because right now we have like zero content, right? There's nothing. It's empty. So to have, you know, to, to, to give you the example of why path auto is super important, I, you need to have at least one piece of content. So let's add something. We'll add a basic page. And I just want you to notice right now that there's only one state. Because we're going to cover that later. So I just want to point that out. There's only one state. You can only publish this thing right now. That's it. There's no archive. There's no, I want to draft. Nope. You go live. That's it. That's your only option. OK? So we have a page. That's great. Anybody ever heard the expression? I, I'm just a dumb question. You've all heard the expression friendly URLs, right? Right. So is that a friendly URL? Node one? No. That's terrible. But that's the default for Drupal and a lot of other CMSs, right? So Path Auto fixes that. Because I could, in theory, I could go in here and I could change the URL alias and I could put it in menu. Let's do that. Let's put it in menu. My test page is in menu now. It's got a name. I can weigh it. The lower the number, the more to the left it is. The higher the number, the more to the right it is, right? And I could actually come in here and call it test hyphen page. Do you want to do that every time you create a page? Not really. And do you trust your users if you have users to do that? No, right? You, this has to be automated. Well, hence the name Path Auto. 
it auto creates paths. Now, as I'm saying that, I remember that I forgot to do my homework <laughs> and show you how to create the path. Now, we're, we're going to do that. I'm going to probably have to cheat and look at another site, see how I did it there, and then kind of emulate that. But, um, <laughs> but remember earlier I was talking about requirements. Well, here you go. Token and chaos tools. So once I get these modules out of the way, then I'm going to be able to install a lot of modules because those are like the most commonly required um, modules that you'll need as dependencies. So once I install these, I'm probably never going to have to worry about this again. So now we're going to have to take a minute. Oh, and I guess we should really look at, at my, my notes here. It says, the path auto module, module automatically gener generates URL path aliases for various kinds of content, like nodes, taxonomy terms, users, without requiring the user to manually specify the path, which we looked at. This allows you to have your aliases like my website slash category slash my node title or my page title, whatever, right? And it doesn't always have to be categories. I just picked that. It could be anything. But you set up those patterns. And then as you develop pages or other content, when you save it and you tell it where it lives in the menu system, Path Auto is going to kick in and create that fancy URL for you. So if you have 18 different categories, right? You could have, and we'll take a look at that. We'll look at a site that I developed that is all about taxonomy, right? Because it's, it's about wildlife. So it's animals and birds and fish and whatever. I don't have to worry about that. If I create a fish, the pattern is always going to be website fish, name of page or name of fish or whatever, right? That, that's what Path Auto is all about. All right, so let's get started really quickly. This will be a little bit of a delay. Because I didn't want to pre-install stuff because I didn't really think that would be fun. But it will take me a minute to get these installed, especially since my hands shake. But without that module, I would, I would have had to click twice to get here, you know, without the admin menu. Okay, I'm not even going to try to in, in, turn it on because I know it has dependencies. No burning questions yet? Will there be a situation where uh, like a depend the dependent module might conflict or break? Where modules or would there be like an update that says this module needs to be updated in order for that module to work? That's a really great question. Give me just one second. Oh, it installed. That's weird. I'm surprised it didn't ask me, tell me that it needed other things installed first. And wait, the last one was C tools, token, and path auto. Did I get token? I did. The last one was path auto. That was probably the one that would have required the. So it didn't. That's why it didn't ask me to install the others. Okay, great. Everything's solved. I'm sorry. Repeat that question. That was really good. Would um, those depending modules, if do they get like outdated and then they break? They don't they break. Keep path auto from working. Yeah. I shouldn't say they don't break. I guess it is possible that something could break, but the thing is, is if, if, if you go to install one mo module and it has a dependency, right? If there becomes an update for the main module, 
you would always want to make sure that the dependencies are updated too, right? So we hopefully will touch on this towards the end, but when I install modules or I do updates, I don't necessarily do it through the UI. I actually do it through the command line and I use a, something called Composer. And I would literally say, Composer require the name of that module with dependencies. And what that does is Composer just, it understands. That means I'm updating this module and I wanna make sure that if there's anything else that's that is, this is dependent on, that, and it, it has updates, everything's getting updated to match. And so there's a way to do that in a very automated fashion. Because if you do it just through the UI, it may not warn you. And to that note, it doesn't even mean that it's going to break it. Because I noticed the other day that there's a, uh, a module that's a dependency, and it's because it, that module doesn't, hasn't had any updates. It doesn't tell me that when I'm looking in the UI, and I didn't notice it. And it turns out that it's really old, and it's not safe. And I, I've been running it for like two years and didn't even know because I've been paying too much attention to the UI and not really looking at everything very carefully. I mean, it didn't break anything and it never got hacked or anything like that, but it turns out, I, you know, I went to, the, to that module page or the project page and I noticed that they did have an alpha release. You know, they had a more, a more updated release. It hadn't met security yet, but this whole time I've been basically running an alpha module that had a beta and an, an official release. And I didn't even know that because it, it, it just didn't let me know in the UI. So it, that's a really great question. Um, okay, so now back to Path Auto. So now, URL aliases. I, I, I probably should have shown you this before installing all the modules, but that's okay. A little bit out of order. Okay, because there, these tabs wouldn't, not all of them would have been here. That's why. Because the, the Path Auto installs this patterns tab for you to allow you to create patterns. All right. And so at this point, to save time, I'm not going to create a pattern and then have to create content to see that pattern work. We'll just look at a website where I'm already doing that so that we can save a little bit of time. Okay. So I, I built this website that needs to be restarted. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Really tiny text, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I built this website. It's kind of like the closest comparison I give you is it's, it's like a nonprofit, right? But there's really not even an organization. It's really just a group of environmentalists who kind of needed a site where they can post a lot of documentation about an area that they, of, that they want to preserve, that they want to keep development out of. And they, did, they had no money. And I'm an environmentalist, so I was like, uh, okay, you know. So we'll, we'll take a look at that site because it, I built it fairly recently and it uses Path Auto and a few other things, so I might reference it as we go along. I'm going to see if there's anything else I should talk about while that's finishing loading. <coughs> this is one we won't install. So while this is while we're waiting for this to finish loading, I'll just really quickly mention that. I mean, for really small sites, maybe you don't care that much about your traffic, but the Google Analytics module, which is fairly easy to install, it's just like any other module, just fire it up. The only tricky part about Google Analytics is Google will want you to prove that you own the site. So you'll need to upload a very small text file into your root directory of your website. Even if you're, you know, if you're doing a really small site, you might be using FTP to do that as opposed to SSH and command line. But either way, you get that file in there and then you go finish filling out your little request for your analytics at Google and that's it, man. Once that thing is 
verified and it's pretty instantaneously, it's pretty instantaneous, um, that's it. From that point on, you can go into Google Analytics and, and, and use it to, you know, see what's happening with your website. And um, it's, it's super powerful. I don't think I need to sell anybody on Google. <laughs> All right, so we have a website. And it, let's see if it loaded. Hmm, uh-oh. Failure, failure. Live hosting, I mean live, live demonstrations, always scary. Yay. Okay, so path auto, configuration, search and metadata, URL aliases. And patterns so it shows me a, a list of all my patterns of all my aliases that have been created as we create content right and so here's how that works okay so like I said this site's heavily 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 dependent on taxonomy so let's we can see the the uh, the patterns right here right so the term the first thing in URL after the website, the, after the first slash, is going to be the vocabulary name, right? And then after that, it has a slash. You actually have to manually add the slash if that's how you want your pattern to look. Because Drupal doesn't care. It's, to it, it's all node, some node number in the background. So you don't need slashes. You could have cra any crazy system you want. But obviously, universally, everybody uses slashes, right? So, and then the term name. And you'll notice that's... For all the other um, content other than taxonomy, it's just the node content type. And I have various content types. So I was, that's what I was saying before. Birds, animals, reptiles, whatever the case may be, it's always going to pick up that node type because I create that type when I create my content, adds the slash and the name of the, the title of the node. So these patterns are pretty easy to create. And what's really cool is when you go to add one, it actually has tokens so that you can, after you... Uh, you can actually, it, you can get help by looking in the tokens and it'll literally tell you like what to add. It'll show you like how you, how you do it you, and you just drag that over. <laughs> it's, it's like that. I'm not going to call it overly simplified, but it, or overly simple. Yeah, the very first time I did it, I scratched my head a little bit, but it's not bad. I mean, and, and it works really, really well. All right. What if you have a current site? That is a really excellent question. So just in case the microphone didn't pick that up for the recording, he asked, well, what if you already have an established pattern, but you want to change that pattern? Like you don't like that pattern anymore. You want to call it something else. It's not applicable. Something changed, right? You literally can do that right there, believe it or not. In that configuration, search metadata, URL aliases, there's actually something called bulk generate and delete. And there is literally a way to make, you know, I'm not sure I'm prepared to actually show you that right now, but you can actually change a pattern and then tell it to go through and anything that had the old pattern, update it to the new pattern. It actually does that. I can't demonstrate it because I don't remember that whole process in my head, but it's in here somewhere. And if not, you can certainly, wait, maybe I already found it again. Select the pattern and then select which URL is to generate. Generate a URL alias for unaliased. Update the URL alias for pass having the old URL alias. There it is. It's a bullet point. It's that simple. I, I think I actually did it once a long time ago. And it worked. It was great. Um, so I think... That covers Path Auto pretty well. I mean, does anybody have any questions about that, about how that works and how you set it up? Good. All right. So um, let's go back here. We talked about Google Analytics. Meta tag. So we talked a little bit about analytics and how this is kind of important, right? Now, meta tag, what meta tag is, is has anybody heard the expression metadata? Do they know what that is? Question? Oh, you know what it is. Great. <laughs> um, well, 
super quickly for anybody who doesn't. Metadata is kind of like tells search engines about this content, right? And Drupal has some metadata in the header, but it's kind of generic across every page. The metadata module actually allows you to give specific met metadata to this page, which is really can be very important, right? Because Google's going to pick up on the text <coughs> on the page anyway. So it's going to pick up certain things anyway and, and increase those rankings. But if the content on the page matches what you put in the metadata, then it's like, OK. It's kind of like that whole like checklist thing. Yep, you passed all these things. Your rankings are really good. You know? So metadata can be really important. And there's, um, I wonder if in my text here I, I mentioned something else. The meta provides structured metadata, aka meta tags, about a website. The content, in this context of search engine optimization, when people refer to meta tags, they're usually referring to the metadata, meta description tag, and the meta keywords tag that may help improve the rankings and display of the site search engine results. I think I copied that right off of the meta tag module page. I probably added, in addition, the module provides support for meta tags, which are the open graph protocol from Facebook and Twitter cards from Twitter that allow control of how content appears when shared on social networks. This is huge if you want the correct representative image to be used when the content is shared. What does that mean? That means when someone's on my page, right, and I've got meta tag working, which I don't, by the way, because I did say this site's fairly new. I still have to do this, all right? And I look at this Anna Swallowtail, right? And I go to share this page on my Facebook. Okay, whatever. The, face, the Facebook sharers should pop up. <laughs> and it would have the wrong image right now because I don't have meta tag, meta tag installed. It's actually going to grab my site in the header, because that's the first image it sees, it's going to grab that. It's going to grab that bird up there. But I don't want that, because I'm sharing a, a, an article about Anna Swallowtails. I want this image. I want the Anna Swallowtail. That's what MetaTag can do for you. you. When you create this piece of co content with the MetaTag module set up correctly and configured correctly, inside the, all right, there it is. I got an error. I'm not really sure why it, I, Facebook is working, but anyway. I don't have MetaTag installed, but had I had it installed, over here on this side, there would be more of these tabs. And inside there, I could actually put a representative image for this page. And I would pick that Swallowtail. And it would make that sharer work. It's a little extra work for you when, when you're creating content. But there are actually some, uh, some, there are some additional modules and some configuration that you can set up in metadata that, that will kind of automate that process. So, it, might, it may or may not grab the right image on the page if you do it fully automated, but it, it will, you can definitely tell it, look, if there isn't an image on the page, then at least grab my default site you know, logo. Don't grab my little icon up on the, in, the, in, in the header. You know, at least grab a, a nice representative image of my website or something. So you can do a lot with it. It's a very powerful module. And how am I doing on time? So I'm over halfway. I better step it up, which is fine, because we're not going to install all of these. OK, redirect. And since I know some of these modules well enough, you're welcome to read the text. Like I said, you can look, read through this more thoroughly later. I'm just going to tell you what redirect's about. If what redirect is about is you can actually set this thing up in an automated fashion. And if you have users who kind of change their mind about their content, then they create a page today, right? Your site gets indexed by Google. And it's now referenced by a certain title, a, a URL, a pattern, right? And then next week or two weeks or three weeks or three months from now, the person goes, wow, that was a really bad title. What was I thinking? And they change the title. Well, guess what? Path Auto updates the URL. Guess what? Google's broken. The link now goes to a 404. Not with redirect set up correctly. Every time somebody changes a pattern, it cr creates a redirect. It says, OK, Google, that page now lives over there. Any questions on that? What else can you do with redirect? All right, on my website, my professional website at work, we have programs, lots of programs, educational academics, right? They've got long titles. So we've got marshall.usc.edu, name, I mean, programs, MBA programs, super long name of an MBA program, 
super long name on some page, right? That's a really long URL. You want to share that with anybody? No. I was like, people are going to look at that. What the hell is that? But you can create, using redirect, a redirect that says marshall.usc.edu slash name of program and redirect it to the long URL. So vanity URLs, shortcut URLs, you can use redirect for that. It's a great module, underused in my humble opinion. Um, any questions on that? <clears throat> great. Uh, link it. Sometimes when you're creating content, especially when you're creating content types for your users, you don't always want to have to hyperlink URLs in, a, um, in the WYSIWYG, right? Let's say you have an, um, I'll give you an example. You have an event content type, and all events are going to have a registration, right? You want to make it really easy to have a registration button. Register now. So in the back end, the user is just putting a URL in a field in the form that he's filling out to create this event. Doesn't have to worry about creating that link to the registration form on the node itself when that event loads. That happens automatically by using a module that allows you to add links to your content types. There's more than one. There's one, uh, actually, Drupal has one built in, just called link. So when you're creating your content types, you can actually add a link and do that right off the bat. So that's built in the core. But I put in link it because it gives you more options. And by the way, I think, if I'm not mistaken, even the core version of link allows you to have attributes. And attributes can be really important because if you're building something, a site that you really need to promote, and you're going to actually run campaigns where you're going to have ads out there, it's going to be really important that those ads can actually know that when they hit that page. And the only way they're going to know that, they, that somebody made it to this page and then clicked on that link is if that link has an ID number. Because it, it, you need to pass something to let, them, you know, to let Google know that they clicked on that link when they got here. So my conversion is working. You know, and that, that's what's nice about links is you can add those IDs. You don't have to go into source code and start making up IDs. You can do it right there in the WYSIWYG. And if I lost any of you guys, I'm sorry. It's getting a little into the weeds there, but it's just good stuff. All right. So also built into core is permissions and roles. You know, and what that does is it allows you to create certain roles so that you have some control over your users. If you're the only person building, working on your website, you don't need to worry about that. You're admin, you can do everything, it's, it's all good. But if you have users, you might need to be able to control that a little bit. You can do that fairly granularly with roles and permissions that are built right into Drupal, okay? But rules, and you know, again, I'm gonna avoid reading this text because I didn't realize time was gonna fly on me this fast. Um, Rules, which sounds like roles and permission, is really much, much more than that. Okay, this module is, does a lot, and I can't even be, scratch the surface. But just to give you an example of what you can do with rules, is if someone creates a piece of content and you want something to happen in the back end automatically, because if I create, if someone creates that piece of content, something else needs to happen. Well, you could train your users and say, hey, if you do that, you're going to need to do that afterwards. I don't know, man. I've got 70 users. And I can tell you half of them can't remember to even publish the damn page. So rules is like, if anybody creates this piece of content, as soon as they publish it, this happens. They don't have to worry about it. It just happens. Those are rules. And like I said, it can do so much more than that. That is a super simplistic, but it's a great module. So if you think that you might be in a situation where you need to control things that happen, make things happen, or make sure things don't happen, <laughs> rules is really good for that. And it can even be used to, for some of the same reasons that you would use rules and permissions. It will do that too. So it's a super powerful, super powerful module. Okay. Seems like I unintentionally put these in a certain order of complexity because they keep getting unintentionally, they're more and more complex. Uh, Paragraphs is a, is a, I don't want to call it new, but it's relatively new, and, and it's really taking hold in, in, in Drupal 8. Um, and part, part of the reason for that is in Drupal and in all content management systems or site development, there's, there's something called atomic design and component-based design where it allows you to kind of compartmentalize uh, content or that you're creating. 
and with Drupal specifically, and, and I could actually demo this if you want to, um, you can have like a, you're in your template, you can have regions on the page, right? So you can have a sidebar and a main content area and a header area and the information area, whatever. And you can put all these components, like lists of them in each region, make them available. And as long as you build your components such that they, the CSS works in that spot, you can empower your users to say, well, in my body content of my area, of my page, all right, let me just view this page real quick. All right, so I have very little going on on this page, right? But as you can see, I have room on the left for a sidebar. I have room on the right for a sidebar. You could allow them to select from all these different components that can create an infinite number of layouts, if you think about it, right? Because the components could be anything from contact us to here's my social media icons, here's my, whatever you can think of. I want to add an event from the event calendar. I want to put it over here. You can use paragraphs to do that. You can create all these paragraphs, components, paragraphs that use components, and allow your users to put them all over the place on a page. So you can have one template that can be rendered dozens of different ways. Does that make sense? So par paragraphs is really powerful. I mean, I wish I had hours to go into just paragraphs because it's like, I mean, it's great. And I, like I said, if anybody really wants to see it and we have time, I'll, I'll demo it from my actual work site because I don't have, you know. So, calendar. Well, there's one that won't take long. I think you guys know what a calendar is. But Core doesn't have one. So if you want a calendar, you'll need calendar. So, you know, events are great. Um, it might take a little bit of development to have a, an event content type that automatically shows up in the calendar because it doesn't do that by default. But not with a little bit of development, it can be done. Okay, workbench access. I mentioned already that Drupal has roles and permissions and roles. And I mentioned already that there's also the rules. But what Workbench Access does, I actually want to read this because to accurately describe it, I had to think it through. So I'm going to read it. So as mentioned earlier, you can use Drupal's roles and permissions to have a lot of control over who can do what. But at, the same, at some point, it could become complicated and cumbersome to use it exclusively. That's because the roles and permissions thing is you create a role and then you have to go through the, the entire list of every single permission that anybody could do to anything and put little check boxes. It works, but what Workbench allows you to do is when you have a lot of users and or need a lot of control, Workbench access works in conjunction with roles and permission and allows you to create work groups which can be added to specific content types which in turn can provide control down to a right down to a single page a specific node or entity if, if needed let me give you a, just a real world super quick example i have a news editor at my job at my where i work i don't want her touching anything other than a news article that might be a a lot of clicking to do with roles and permissions in that UI. But with this thing, I create a role called a news editor, and I tell that news editor they can only edit news entities, and that's it, end of story. They can't touch anything else. They can create them, they can edit them, they can do anything they want, they can't touch anything else. This module makes that like really easy. It's great. Um, I don't want to go into it any deeper than that just to not spend too much time on it because I don't even know, have any idea what you guys are building. You might not need that. You might not have more than a handful of users. And if you only have a handful of users, you can probably trust that they're not going to do what they're not supposed to do. Right? But I got 70 users. I have to worry about that. Okay, web form. I, this is a, you know, Drupal in core, there's a feedback form that's just there. Okay? But the feedback form doesn't actually... It just sends emails, and it's pretty limited. The you know the form fields that you have. Um, hey, it works. If that's all you need, great. You know, but for us, people want to start email lists and things of that nature. Each program wants their own form to collect their own emails, and they want to ask specific information, and they don't necessarily want their inbox being cluttered with hundreds of emails. 
right? So they say to us, we need a contact form. Turn off the emails. Just send me a report at the end of the month. Wow, that's what web forms is really powerful for. Okay, you can have multi-step web forms where you finish one part and then that takes you to the next step and takes you to the next step. Or you can just have a bunch of customized fields with drop downs and choices and whatever. And you can have it send emails and you can have that thing CC a dozen people if you need to. Or you can just send it all to the database and run a report later. Okay, it's pretty powerful. If you need forms of any kind, it's a great module. All right. Big, big, big time got gotcha, you though. Rick, I have a question about Sure. How does Webform as a module compare to uh, you know, vendor third party services like FormStack or so on? Can you compare? Well, the beauty of that is so we're a Salesforce shop. Anybody not heard of Salesforce? Salesforce? That's like the biggest customer relational database type thing you can have, right? Because we're a university, so we need like massive, you know. <laughs> we, embed, we embed Salesforce forms all the time, you know, because let's face it, Drupal's got its own database, but what good is that if you need to get all these people, you don't want to copy and paste all that into a, da into a customer relational database where you can follow up with mass emails and keep track of them and what they're doing and stuff. I mean, to the point where we literally like send them an email and we know if they come back to the website as a result of that email, which started out from them filling out that form, and that's how we know who they are. Like it's a, you know, so to answer your question, it doesn't compare. But if you're building a simple site and you just what's that? It's good for if you're building yourself. It and especially if your site's not very big and you don't have those kind of resources. If all you need to do is collect the data so that you can reach out to people, you can most certainly export this thing as a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet and import that into MailChimp and bam, you're, you're, you're off and running and you spent nothing. So is it good? It's great. Does it compare to other things? Mm, well, you know, you can start embedding all kinds of fancy stuff. Drupal's super powerful that way. Nothing's going to stop you from doing that. Um, but if you do install any form, <laughs> You're gonna need CAPTCHA, Honeypot, something, because you're gonna get spammed, you know? There's nothing that can stop the robots from finding a name field, and a, a text, any freeform text field, and a submit button. It, they're gonna find you. It's just a matter of time, okay? So you'll want that, because it'll, it'll slow the spam down for sure. Uh, why not prevent it? Because, you know, people can actually sit in front of their computer and fill out forms, you can't stop that. Um, so, I'm sure everybody's been to a website where they click on an image and they get that nice little pop-up that has like the, the overlay where it kind of grays out the background and whatever. That's Lightbox. You know, Drupal doesn't have anything like that built in. Um, there's lots of other modules to do this too. This was just one example, but you're probably going to want something like that. I personally use something called um, a bootstrap module that uh, creates, you know, the same effect, that same overlay, but it also does allows for slideshows. So since I was building a site that's about nature, it made sense to have, you know, you could click on that relatively small image, overlay the whole page edge to edge with a nice big fat slideshow, and it was one module, almost zero configuration, and it works. So, um, so that was my top dozen. Does anybody think I missed anything there? Is there anything that you would want for your website that I didn't mention? I'm just curious. We got one. I'm a really big fan of Masquerade. Masquerade. Let's you, uh, someone calls up and says, hey, I've got a problem with the web, they hang on, sit still, and they can, you can log in and see their screen, you're masquerading as them. Oh, and that's a Drupal module. Yeah. Wow. And, and I have to give credit, that's, that's uh, Mario's suggestion from some years back, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. So I, I All right. Well, just for the sake of the microphone, just in case it's facing the wrong way, Masquerade was a suggested module that's super great, allows you to uh, assist a user by masquerading as them and logging into their machine. It's almost like a Zoom session where you're going to share a screen kind of thing. But there you go. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. All right. It, I thought it was, I'm sorry. I, that's okay. I could be wrong. I thought it was, it just allows you to sign in as that user. And so it's not that you're taking over their Ah, uh, gotcha. So it has to be a user that's having a problem. No, I mean, it's just, it, it's like a user calls up and says, you know, I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing. Then you 
you have, you can just, as an admin. Rain, jump in. He's got it. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go home and install that module. You know how we've been doing it? Just create a, a non existent user and log in as that user with those rules and permissions. But masquerading is much easier because now I can, just I can just masquerade as an existing user. Why, have to main why do I have to maintain a fictitious user? I like it because I have, believe me, I said I had 70 users. I have 70 active users. There's like 140 people in there. I've got people that had created an account and never logged in. So I could masquerade as them so easily, you know. Don't have to worry about actually logging in as somebody who's working. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's a great, great suggestion. Thank you. Um, so what's in core? Core, like I was saying when I first started this thing, there's a bunch of stuff in core, okay? Is, does anybody need like a super short demo of what a view is, what a view looks like, or is, it, did, is that kind of understood? You'd like one? It'll only take a second, so I'm, I'm happy to do it, okay? So I want to just say that this whole website is built on Bardic, which is the default theme that when you install Drupal, you get Bardic, right? Um, I made it not so Bardic-like by adding my own sub theme to it. So um, that's not really a module, theming and sub theming, but I just wanted to point that out because of this, this home page. I didn't build this view. This was actually comes with Drupal. This is like the home page that you get when you install Drupal, right? Now, granted, I did add the image to this view because by default it just gives all the articles or any, any new content that's created. It's just there's a checkbox and you create a piece of content that says, make this, you know, this is important. And if you make it important, I forget the exact phrase, but it will automatically show up on the homepage. And that automatic showing up on the homepage is a view. And you can create your own views, right? So I did. So each and every one of these tabs is a view that I created. So I created a content type called an animal. So when anybody creates an animal, it automatically shows up here the minute they create it. Nobody has to come to this page and add another box. That box happens because of a view. So what is a view technically? A view is this, it's a, allows you in the user interface to build an insanely complicated SQL statement. Does anybody know? Does that, did I just lose anybody with a SQL statement? Okay, good, because that is a little technical. But it joins different tables together and collects a bunch of information like tags, um, taxonomies, images, the text you wrote about it, grabs all that, puts it together, and makes your page, right? It's a super complex query to the database about everything that you filled out when you created this piece of content, right? So I wish I could spend more time on it. It's so fascinating. And views is one of my favorite things. In fact, one of the best presentations I ever saw on views was given by Rain back there. So accolades to Rain. Um, so let's go back to this really quickly. So workflows. I've got about five minutes, huh? Man, that just sucks. Because I really wanted to get to some of this stuff and give you some demonstrations because this is, this is some really good stuff in here. But um, workflows is, is built into core now. And what workflows allows you to do is it allows you to have different states. And, and it not only allows you to have different states, but it allows you to have different workflows, meaning that Having different states is just one workflow. You can have other types of workflows. But what this allows you to do, and this is really important because we have a lot of users, right? And they're always asking, I don't want to go live. I want to play with this page, right? I want to create a draft. I'm not ready. I don't want to, I don't know if I'm going to like it, right? Well, that's what workflows allows you to do. It gives you, your users the ability to archive pages they don't want to use anymore, which will automatically take it out of the menu system, right? And we don't even allow them to edit the menu, but we don't have to worry about that one thing. If they want to archive it, it just drops out of the menu, right? If they want to delete the page, that's another story. But if workflows allows them to create drafts, it allows them to archive things. And, and, with, and you can use another module on top of that um, to actually allow you know, people to log in as different roles, to whether they can see unpublished content and all that stuff. So you can create all these pretty elaborate workflow systems using you know, various modules, but it starts out with workflows, right? So I would, I mean, I really planned on demonstrating. If I had no idea, I'd talk so much and it would take that, this long to get through it. But um, 
content moderation is, is actually the, the states I was referring to. So the workflow is, is the workflow process, but the content moderation is actually the states. So those are those they kind of work hand in hand. You kind of you, you can't really do one without the other. In fact, I'll try to blaze through that really quick. All right. So disable by default. It works in conjunction with, in conjunction with content moderation. You can't really have one without the other. But this module is what allows you to have more than one workflow, which in turn allows you to have content different content moderation states on different content types. So you might need more states for one type of content than the other, and workflows is what allows that to happen. Moderation is the states itself that you create. Um, I wanted to show that to you, but I can't. OK, so media, it's built into core. All right, I'm going to really have to blaze. But so it's not even enabled by default. You have to turn it on. OK, and what that does is it, it, it creates essentially a, a media library so that you can go to your website and see all of your media. So I go to content and look at all of my media. So that occurs because of the media module. I turned it on. Now, in this case, because I, most of the site's built on taxonomy and nodes, there's not much media in here because the, all, that, all that, those images and stuff were just part of that node. They're not really media. But I did add one piece of media. Um, so the thing about media is there's also another module called Media Library which I find really confusing because the library really already exists. But, um, but the thing about the, the library is, is that it'll, it, it, that becomes your gateway to putting media into your content. Because you can start building this media library, but by default, there's no way to get that media into the, the actual content. You'll need the, the other module to do that. That's kind of like that gateway to, make those, to connect those two things. Okay. Um, wow, I am out of time, so I'm just going to, I'm going to blaze. I'm actually pretty close to the end. Yeah, that was really close to the end, actually. What I was going to, what I was going to, to also display for you, um, it's so, I, and I don't want to really run over time at all to take away from the next presenter, but there's some, the WYSIWYG, you can customize it, and it's pretty easy, and if you want to have any kind of branding to give your, your users, like you, you want to give them certain color, text, but you don't want to necessarily give them free reign so they don't bring in a million different colors. You can actually customize your WYSIWYG, and it's pretty darn easy. So maybe we can get, have a birds of a feather later, and you guys, if you want to get a, a little bit more introduction into some of the things I, I couldn't dive into here, I'm happy to do that later. But you'll need to let me know so I can try and schedule something. All right, so that's it. I'm going to stop my recording on some remarkable I didn't run out of disk space. <laughs>